Hey friends, welcome to Let's Be Real. We've got a special episode today from my other podcast called How to Study the Bible. Just about the same time during the pandemic, we started Let's Be Real and How to Study the Bible, and it's been such a joy to see how that podcast has been used to help people discover God's Word. It's a very simple format where each and every week we open a passage of Scripture and ask four questions of the Bible, and um, I hope that you might enjoy it and find it to be a helpful resource for your own journey in faith. So we're in a series uh, for Advent called God of Our Mothers. We're looking at all of the moms in Jesus's lineage as we find in Matthew chapter one. And let me tell you, these are some scandalous stories. So if you wanna take a listen to a couple of stories that you might not even realize are in the Bible, come on over to How to Study the Bible and enjoy this first episode right now. And if you do enjoy it, we'd love to invite you to like, subscribe, leave a review, and come join our tribe over at How to Study the Bible. All right, everyone, enjoy. We are never defined by our past. Everything in our life wants us to believe that we're defined by what we've been, by how we failed, by the mistakes that we've made, that we, we can do something that will always define us for the rest of our life. But God seems to be saying again and again in scripture that we are not defined by our past, that there is nothing that can define us more completely and fully past, present, and future than our standing as sons and daughters of God. And that it's because of Christ, because of Christ's birth and that we celebrate at Christmas time, that we can even have the, the freedom and the ability to be sons and daughters of God and that God gives us that through Jesus. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to How to Study the Bible and welcome to Advent. We are in the five weeks leading up to Christmas and I'm looking forward to these next few weeks where we're going to take a look at some stories that may be familiar to you and some stories that may not. We're going to be looking at the women in Jesus's lineage as we look at the way that Jesus is introduced to us in the Gospels. We see, particularly in the book of Matthew, that a chronology is given of his life and of the people in his ancestry. And in a very unusual turn of events, there are women listed in that lineage. Generally, the, that lineage would only include fathers or men, and it stands out that women are included. So we're going to ask the question, why are these women included? And what do we want to know about them? And what does it teach us about who God is and what he desires for us? So that's what we're going to be doing over the next five weeks. But I want to let you guys know, I also have a gift for you this Christmas if you're interested in bringing uh, some meaning into your family gathering, whatever that family gathering looks like, whether that's family or friends, I've written a very simple liturgy that you can use on Christmas Eve. Now, what's a liturgy? It's a it's a ritual. It's a way of creating a tradition. And in this particular liturgy, what I do is give you chances to ask different kids to speak. And there's a read along sort of format where everyone is connected and involved in reading along and through the idea of who Jesus is and why he came. So it's just my gift to you this season. If you'd like to check it out, you can go to NicoleUnis.com slash Christmas and you can get the free download and use it however you'd like. I'd love to love to hear how that might be helpful to you. Again, it's NicoleUnis.com slash Christmas if you want to check that out. Okay, we're going to jump in today and we're going to start with that genealogy that I just mentioned, which is in Matthew chapter one. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter one and Genesis chapter 38 today. Let's go over to Matthew one. And when you open up to that place in your Bible, you're going to see a very long list of names. And this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And that genealogy starts with Abraham, which I love because we already looked at 
Abraham and Isaac and Jacob earlier this fall. So we're kind of going right into this next step of really understanding who these people are. So we've got this list of names. You're going to see Abraham. You're going to see Isaac. You're going to see Jacob. And then when we get to Jacob, we stop there and we see in verse three, it says Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. So we're going to start there with Tamar today. Who is Tamar and why is she in Jesus's genealogy? Let's take a look. Okay, so now we're going to scoot over to Genesis 38 and take a look at this story. A couple things that you want to know about context as we get into this. The first is that this chapter is sandwiched between the story, the long story of Joseph. And it's kind of strange that it would be there. So we we get introduced to Joseph as one of the brothers of, you know, one of the sons of Jacob. Judah is going to be his brother that we're going to look at today. And we get this like moment where Joseph is being sold into slavery. And then we just switch and we've got this other story that feels really graphic and a little bit maybe out of place, but actually it it isn't out of place. And we know this about the Bible that a lot of times when something seems odd or strange, it's not that it actually is odd or strange. It's that we have to do the work to understand why it's been placed where it is. And when we look at the meta narrative of what's going on here in Genesis, we're going to see that the wickedness of Judah that we're going to see in this story is sort of a foil to the righteousness of Joseph. But what's incredible is that as this story goes forward, we're actually going to see Judah take a righteous turn and become a righteous man who actually experiences repentance and change in his life. So it it makes sense that in Genesis 38, we're going to hear about Judah and his life. And that's going to then contrast to what we hear about Joseph moving forward from there. So, but we're going to, we want to know and understand for our purposes who Tamar is, which is what we're going to find in Genesis 38. So I encourage you to go read it. I'm going to give you a quick flyover because it's a long chapter of what's going on here. So what we learn in this story is that, first of all, Genesis 38, 1, Judah leaves his family and he goes to make his fortune somewhere else. He goes to the land of Canaan and he lives with Canaanites. Now, what we want to understand is that the Israelites were set apart people who were meant to experience and show and express God's love and God's holiness to the world. And so the the fact that Judah was going to leave what he knew and marry some Canaanite lady was not cool. So he's already outside of the plan, right, when he's going to do this. And it says that he met a daughter and he married her and she became pregnant and they ended up with three sons. And as they have these three sons, the first son was wicked in God's sight. Now, we don't know what that means, but you can fill in the blank of what you think makes a man wicked, probably greedy, probably violent, probably oppressive. And he was married to a woman named Tamar. So we know that God actually puts heir, this first husband, to death. We don't know all that happened here, but we know that it was God's design that this husband would die. So now we have Tamar with no husband. And there is a law within the righteousness of the Israelites. This is the way God set it up. And you can read about this in Leviticus. But there's a law within the Israelites that are going to provide for women like Tamar. Because if you're a woman in that day and age, you have no property, you have no rights, you have no vote, you don't hold resources. And so the only way for a woman in this particular culture to be safe and to be provided for was to be married into a family, to be in a household. So the fact that Tamar is does not have a son and now does not have a husband is a big deal. And so what God has done is that he set up this idea of how to provide for women who are widows. And the idea is that they need to be married into other members of the family and that that would be the redeemer of them would be another male relative in the family that would kind of keep them in the family. And what that does is it allows that deceased husband sort of family line to go on, right? So we're we're building out this tribe of people and we don't need to get into like whether that we know that's not right. This is just what what was. We're just reporting on what was. And oftentimes I think what would it be like to be, you know, a hundred years from now looking back at 2022 and our grandchildren and great, great, great grandchildren are probably going to have a lot to say about the culture that we're in 2022. But when you're in it, you're just in it. 
And this is just what was. God isn't making a stance or a command about the way to treat women. In fact, we're going to see that God has his designs on how he cares for the marginalized, but it just was, was what the culture was at the time. So the idea for Tamar is that she needs to be given to another brother so that she can have offspring, so she can have sons that are going to continue the original brother's line. So Judah then says to his middle son, now you need to take Tamar as your wife. But Onan, this is the, the middle son, he doesn't, he mistreats Tamar as well. And he's like, I'm going to sleep with her, but I'm not going to allow her to get pregnant. And the Lord knew that he was doing that. And so it says in verse 10 that the Lord put him to death also. So now we've got one daughter-in-law with no husband and two sons who have been put to death by the Lord. So imagine being Judah at this time. You now have only one son left. And so Judah says to Tamar, live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shela grows up. For he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. Now, let's just talk about this is not a good scene for Tamar. It is not good to get sent back to your father's household. Because again, that is the whole idea with women and daughters is that they need to be married off into other people's households. So if we're in Tamar's shoes right now, this is not a good life. She has been mistreated. We know that she's been mistreated so badly that the Lord has put to death the men that have been close to her in her life. So again, you can fill in the blank on what you think that means, but this is not an easy life that Tamar has lived. And then it also says that Judah's wife then dies and he has no intention of giving his third, his only left son to Tamar. Who knows if he thought Tamar was cursed or Tamar was a witch or Tamar had some sort of hex on her, but he, it makes it clear in scripture that Judah had no intention of ever giving his youngest son to Tamar. So he has lied. He sent Tamar back to his father's household. He has now grieved his own wife dying. And Tamar gets this understanding that she's never going to be cared for. And there's got to be a part of her that's like, I have to make my way and I have to figure out how I'm going to be cared for. And she knew and had waited so long that Shayla, the youngest, the youngest had grown up already and she had never been given to him. So She is a woman without options. She's out of options and she's out of relationships and she is out of favor and she takes matters into her own hands. And what she ends up doing is disguising herself as a prostitute, as a shrine or or a temple prostitute in the hopes that her father-in-law Judah might sleep with her. So let's keep in mind, all Tamar has done is put herself in a position to hopefully change her fortune. But it is Judah himself who comes and propositions her. And so she says back to him, well, what will you give me to sleep with you? And he says, I'll send you a young goat from my flock. And and imagine you are a woman who's been given many empty promises by this man. He does not know who you are. And so she raises the stakes and says, you need to give me something as a pledge. I'm not going to take you at your word. And I think also Tamar was probably like, and I don't want your goat. So he says, what pledge should I give you? And this is so shrewd. She actually asks for his personal calling card. She basically asked for his driver's license and his passport. If you were going to put this in modern day, she's like, how about you leave these things with me? So she asked for his seal, his cord and the staff in his hand. These would be the ways that Judah was known. These are his personal identifiers. So she takes those things. She sleeps with him or he sleeps with her and she becomes pregnant. And this is now going to be her ticket out. But before she gets a ticket out, she's currently an unwed woman who is now discovered to be pregnant. And you can imagine that this did not go well for her and it would not go well for her. And word reaches Judah. And in verse 24, we hear your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution. And as a result, she is now pregnant. And Judah responds with bring her out and have her burned to death. Now, you can imagine how Tamar might be brought out to be burned to death. This is going to be a violent treatment of Tamar. I'm sure she was terrified. Can you imagine? And she sends a message to her father-in-law and she sends him his seal and his cord and his staff privately. And she says, I'm pregnant by the man who owns these. 
And so now Judah is faced with a moment Tamar has in complete vulnerability given up her power. She doesn't wait until there's a crowd around to reveal the staff. She does not embarrass or shame her father-in-law. But as she is about to be either beaten or burned to her death or both, she sends away her power and she sends them to Judah and says, I am pregnant by this man. And in verse 26, in this incredible moment where Judah is confronted with his own sin, he's confronted with his own passivity and his own wickedness in the way that he has treated this woman for who knows how many years have gone by, many years. And he recognizes his staff and his seal and his cord. And he responds with, she is more righteous than I, since I would not give her to my son, Shelah. This is how we know he was never going to give Shelah to Tamar. And he doesn't sleep with her again, it says. And so Tamar is rescued from the edge of death, from the edge of her own murder by Judah, the very person who has treated her poorly all of these years. And the story goes on and says that she has twin boys from this pregnancy. And we know later in the story that these twin boys are in Judah's household, that she's in Judah's household. Judah returns to his family and the story of Joseph continues. This is where we see Judah's sort of character evolve. And this is really a turn toward righteousness that happens in his life is right in this moment when he's confronted with his sin by Tamar. And what we know from this moment is that the story goes on and we see these sons, these boys up here again in Genesis 46, that as the tribes of Israel were being brought up and into Egypt because of this great famine that we see in the whole story of Joseph. And in Genesis 46, 12, we see the sons of Judah are listed, Er, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. And those are the boys, those are the sons, again, who've been listed. Um, Aaron and Onan have died, as we know from this story. But these boys end up being the sons of Judah. They be, end up being the lineage, the, the tribe continues from there. And then we get to see fast forward into the genealogy of Jesus that in this line of Perez is where Jesus's lineage comes from. So Tamar is a ancestor of Jesus, the mother of Jesus in Jesus's lineage. And this is very important for us to understand that this genealogy is not just an encyclopedia of names. In fact, lots of names are left out. And one time uh, when genealogies are given in scripture, there's this concept of telescoping genealogies, meaning some things are left out and only the things that are important to the narrative, the people and the names that are important to the narrative are left in. So the women's names are left in. Well, many names are left out. And I think we've got to know the backstory of Tamar so that we can understand and ask the question, well, what does this mean? What are the principles here that we learn from this passage? We know what it says. We know a bit about the backstory. So what does this mean for us that Tamar is listed in Jesus's genealogy, purposely listed? And now we know her story. And and here's a couple of things that I wrote down for principles that I think we could pull from this passage. The first one is that God colors outside the lines. God does not seem very interested in staying in any of the human created lines that we like to make about who's in and who's out, who's powerful and who's not powerful. All of those kind of lines seem to be abolished by God. He doesn't color inside of those lines. He seems to enjoy coloring outside of those lines. Tamar was not an Israelite. Tamar prostituted herself to take care of herself. She was scrappy and desperate and had been mistreated. And God sees, God sees the marginalized. We see that over and over again, that theme in scripture over and over again. Finally, that I just wrote down after reading Tamar's story and how it turns and, and how she is mistreated and then how she comes into a place where she's part of an Israelite family and that these boys really save her and save her life. And I wrote down, we are never defined by our past. Everything in our life wants us to believe that we're defined by what we've been, by how we failed, by the mistakes that we've made, that we we can do something that will always define us for the rest of our life. But God seems to be saying again and again in scripture that we are not defined by our past, that there is nothing that can define us more completely and fully past, present, and future than our standing as sons and daughters of God. And that it's because of Christ, because 
of Christ's birth and that we celebrate at Christmas time, that we can even have the, the freedom and the ability to be sons and daughters of God and that God gives us that through Jesus. So I want to close with just a little passage from Jesus's life as I'm going to do each week that connects us. Okay, we've got the story of Tamar, the genealogy of Jesus. And then how do we see these principles maybe that were coming from these ancient stories coming to life with Jesus? And I just want to share these two verses as we close from Matthew chapter nine. Here's Jesus now all grown up in public ministry. And this is what it says. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So what does this mean for us today, friends? Well, first of all, we have to ask ourselves, how do we define ourselves? Are we righteous on our own or are we sinners on our own? Can we relate to the desperation of Tamar taking matters into her own hands, being marginalized, being mistreated, feeling left out? Because if we can relate, then we can receive. And what we have to receive are the words of Jesus that say, I have come for the sick. I have come for the sinners and I've come to bring mercy. And if you can relate to that, then you know what a gift it is that Jesus Christ was born to us. Talk to you guys next week.